to another episode of Crime and Curiosities. First of all, sorry for the long wait in between episodes. I've just been super busy with work, and when I come home from work, I'm like, I want to take a nap, not record a podcast. But <laughs> I'm getting back into things, um, and that was partially inspired by something really cool that happened, um, which was the Crime Junkie podcast, which is like a super popular a true crime podcast listed me as a source on their website for their recent episode on Kimberly McAndrews case. So that was super cool and it kind of like lit a fire under me to get back into research and recording. So that's where we're at today. When I started this podcast, I always knew that I wanted to cover more than crime, uh, hence the reason crime and curiosities is the name. I have like such a wide array of interests that I knew that I wanted to do something more than crime. So today we're gonna venture into the curiosities part of things. As I mentioned, I guess, in the first episode, something I'm really like into learning about and researching is different diseases. And one of my favorite shows is Monsters Inside Me, which is a show about like parasites and like really rare diseases and things you can get on tropical vacations and stuff like that and the kind of stuff that would like scare a lot of people but I find it really interesting. I've seen every episode of that show so I knew that I wanted to cover this certain parasite uh, on an episode of Crime and Curiosities. So today we're going to be learning about Nycleria phalari, otherwise known as the brain-eating amoeba. What inspired me mostly to do this was that um, I had saw a few articles that a few people this summer had passed from uh, Nycleria phalari infection, which we'll learn about in a minute. So I wanted to do an episode and kind of talk about it and just talk about how crazy it is that this is even a thing. So I'm going to start out with just a a simple little bit of knowledge about the actual organism itself. Bear in mind that I am not a scientist. I'm barely past biology in high school. This is not my forte. All I'm doing is relaying information, mostly from the CDC website, uh, so the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., and also information from three particular episodes of Monsters Inside Me, and I will list them on the Facebook page. there's They've covered the parasite in three episodes and they give a really good breakdown of uh, just the like mechanisms of the organism and stuff. So that's, um, I will do my best to also give a really good breakdown, but if you're looking for more information, that would be the place to go. Nigleria is an amoeba or a single-celled living organism that is found in warm, fresh water. And there's only one type or species of Nigleria that infects humans, and that's Nigleria phalari, or the brain-eating amoeba. Nigleria phalari infects people when it enters the body through the nose. Here's what's really important to know. You cannot get sick by simply ingesting water that's contaminated with Nigleria phalari. In order to cause infection, the amoeba must enter the body through the nose, where it travels to the brain and destroys the brain tissue, hence brain-eating amoeba. Nigleria phalari is found in bodies of warm, fresh water, hot springs, warm water discharge from industrial plants, naturally hot drinking water sources, poorly maintained swimming pools, and rarely in water heaters, as they can only survive for short periods of time at temperatures higher than 115 degrees Fahrenheit or 46 degrees Celsius. So the good news for us Canadians, and um, especially those near the ocean, is that Nigleria phalari cannot survive in hot water, and we also don't have the temperatures for it to survive. So the warmer the water, up to 115 Fahrenheit, uh, the more chance of finding Nigleria phalari. Also, you cannot get Nigleria phalari through water vapor or mist that's inhaled through the nose. It has to be straight up fresh water that enters your body through the nose. So, as I mentioned, it grows best at temperatures up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit or 46 degrees Celsius. The lower the temperature of the water, the less likely it is that it's contaminated, but there is still a risk, which we'll talk about in a moment. If you live somewhere warm, like the southern states, and you're in fresh water, you should always assume that there's a risk of Nigleria phalari infection. And you might be thinking, oh, it's just an amoeba, why do I have to be so worried about it? Okay, please keep in mind the name brain-eating amoeba 
and fasten your seatbelts because you're going to hear a story about what it does to people and it's just absolutely crazy, okay? So buckle up. I find this stuff mind-blowing. <laughs> Anyways, it lives in the sediment of freshwater lakes, ponds, etc., and it eats other organisms and bacteria that's found in those bodies of water. It's more commonly found in lakes in the southern states, but has been found in northern states as well. And rarely Nigeria phalari is found in other sources, like poorly maintained swimming pools. But as I mentioned before, that's extremely rare. The most common place you're going to get it is a lake. There is no rapid or routine test for Nigleria phalari, so it's not like it's not like if you go to the hospital with a really bad flu and they can like give you a flu test or it's not like even some other like parasites that I've learned about that they can test for. It's not like that. There's no rapid and routine test because it is so rare. So there's no way that they can just take your blood, send it off to a lab, and know like the next day if you have Nigleria phalari. And the same goes for a water source. There's no rapid or routine test to test a water source for Nigleria phalari. It can take weeks to identify. So as I mentioned, you should always assume a low risk of infection if you're in warm, fresh water. And I'm not talking what we as Canadians would think of as warm, fresh water, but like like I said, southern states, um, Florida in particular for some reason. The risk of infection is extremely low, and I want to underline that, extremely low. There's only been 34 infections from 2009 to 2018. In comparison to that, there's been 34,000 drowning deaths in the same amount of time. So you're more likely to drown than you are to get Nigleria phalari. Uh, statistics on those 34 infections 30 of those infections occurred from recreational sports, and one occurred from contaminated tap water used in a backyard slip and slide. But three of those infections occurred when someone used a contaminated water for a neti pot. So if you don't know what a neti pot is, it's um, like a sinus irrigation thing. It's a, like a little plastic thing that looks like a teapot, and you're supposed to fill it with sterile water and pour it up your nose and it helps clear mucus um, out of your nose if you have like a sinus problem or a really bad cold or something like that. But the key to this is using sterile water. So you would wanna like go to the pharmacy and get like distilled water or something that you know has been cleaned. You might wanna like boil water and then cool it and use that. I'm not a doctor, so don't like use this for advice, but definitely don't use just plain tap water in your neti pot because three people have died from the brain eating amoeba from using their neti pots so that's crazy neti pots freak me out anyway so i don't know just don't use tap water in a neti pot that's crazy and also remember that the only way to get an igleria phalari infection is through the nose and i will explain that a little bit more later like the exact mechanics of it but yeah, so you're essentially just pouring infected water into the exact place that it needs to be. To be fair, like I said, 30 of those deaths was recreational sports, and it is more likely to happen during recreational water sports, like diving and jumping, because that those are the events where you're more likely to have water forced up your nose. And it also is more common in boys and that's just because statistically boys are more likely to participate in water sports that's not to say that it hasn't happened to females of course it has of course females participate in water sports too but overall it's more common in boys and it also seems to be a little more common in young people and i would assume that's because they would be more likely to be participating in water sports as well it's most common in the summer months of July, August, and September, or other prolonged periods of heat and low water levels. So, as I mentioned before, the hotter the water, the more likely to find an infection. So you might be thinking, why wouldn't we just like test water for this and post a sign, you know, as you see around here, don't swim at this beach because there's this certain, you know, algae or whatever. That's not effective with Nigleria phalari for a few reasons. The bacteria or the amoeba is really common, but infection is really rare. So it might be in the majority of water sources in a warm southern place, but the risk of infection is still quite low. So um, posting signs would just kind of, you know, create a, a hysteria. 
Um, also, the connection between finding Nagleria phalari in water and the occurrence of infection is still sort of unclear, so the rate of infection uh, as compared to the instance of Nagleria phalari in water, the connection is still super unclear. They don't have exact numbers on that, so also would be ineffective. And the location and number of the amoeba can vary over time within the same water source, so from day to day there could be more or less of the amoeba, so again, posting a sign wouldn't be completely effective. And as I mentioned, there's no rapid and standard test for Nagleria phalari, so again, a sign would be useless. And they can create the misconception that areas with no signs are Nagleria phalari free, which might not always be true because there's no testing, etc. So what can you do to not get Nagleria phalari? Because obviously if you live in the southern states, you're going to want to be in the water. I would want to be in the water if I lived somewhere hot, like Florida or something like that. So this is super simple to prevent. I'm not going to say you can't dive, you can't do water sports, because you can. This is super simple to prevent nose plugs. Nose plugs, nose plugs, nose plugs. If you, you know, going to a southern state, or if you live there, if you live near a source of warm, fresh water, and you are going to be diving, or in any situation where water from that source could be forced up your nose, a pair of nose plugs could literally save your life. So keep that in mind. But here's where things get a little deeper. It's not necessarily the amoeba that kills you. The amoeba causes something called PAM, or primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. So I'm not gonna say that word again, so I'm just gonna call it PAM because it's a really long, hard word. So it's PAM that kills you, um, which is brought on by Nigleria phalari. And it's a brain infection that, again, destroys the brain tissue and causes swelling and eventually death. An early stage is similar to bacterial meningitis, and um, initial symptoms occur at about five days after infection, with a headache, fever, nausea, and vomiting, and later symptoms include stiff neck, confusion, lack of attention to people and surroundings, loss of balance, seizures, and hallucinations. This is all because of what's happening to your brain. After the start of symptoms, there's usually a rapid progression and death occurs within five days. The fatality rate is over 97% for survivors out of 145 known infections in the U.S. from 1962 to 2018. I think there's been a few more cases now, a few more deaths, and also one or two more survivors, but I'm not entirely sure on that. There is no distinct treatment for an Igleria phalari infection, which I will explain a little later, but it's kind of just up to your body to fight it off. As I mentioned, um, one of the things that got me like interested in this amoeba was the show Monsters Inside Me. And on this show, they cover the story of a little boy named Kyle Lewis, who was seven years old and infected with Nigleria phalari. So I'm gonna share a little bit of Kyle's story with you, just so you understand how truly devastating that this disease can be. Kyle was a seven-year-old boy. I believe him and his family lived in Texas. He had a mom named Julie, his dad's name was Jeremy, and his sister's name was Peyton. They spent the weekend at their family's lake house before, you know, gearing up for back to school, and Kyle was also in baseball, and his father was excited for him to get back uh, on the field. So they had their weekend away at the lake house, went home, got back to school, Kyle played a scrimmage game that first week back, and his father said he noticed that he was sweating more when he would come in between innings, but he assumed it was just because his son was working hard on the field, you know, really putting himself into the game. He goes on to complain of a headache, and his parents keep him home from school, and during that day he begins to vomit, and his temperature is unstable, so his mom said that it would like rise and fall, but it never went back to what we would consider a normal body temperature. So he always had a fever. It was just either low grade or high grade. His parents are keeping an eye on him. He starts to vomit sort of more regularly and he still has a fever. And his mom said that it was unusual for him to be that sick. He was seven and she couldn't remember a time that he had been that ill. So they decide to take him to Cook Children's Hospital, which is in Fort Worth, Texas where the nurses examine him, and because of his headache, fever, and vomiting, they suspect meningitis. As we learned before, 
um, the early stages of Nigleria phalari are very similar to bacterial meningitis. And that's part of the reason that it's so hard to treat is because it gets mistaken for another illness in the beginning. And then by the time you can treat it, it's too late. Just a little bit about what meningitis is because it is part of the name of PAM, which is what causes death in Leria thalari infection. Meningitis is the inflammation of the tissues that surround the brain and can be caused by an array of microorganisms. You can get bacterial, viral, you can have meningitis, as I mentioned, caused by a parasite, and it can be deadly if left untreated. So they admit Kyle and perform a spinal tap. A spinal tap provides the doctors with cerebral spinal fluid, which can give um, clues about the type and the cause of meningitis, but Kyle's cerebral spinal fluid, the first test is inconclusive for the cause of his meningitis. He does have a high white blood cell count, so they decide to monitor him for 24 hours. His condition stabilizes, but his parents notice that he's very anxious. and. His mom says it's more than just a kid being scared because he's sick and in the hospital. He was like having true anxiety. He didn't want his mother to leave him, you know, things like that. She mentions that he wouldn't even let her get out of the bed with him. The doctors say that from the beginning something seemed off with Kyle's case. It wasn't just straight meningitis, which obviously we know it's more than that, but at the time they didn't. Um, so it leaves the doctors kind of puzzled, but they just tell Kyle's parents that the anxiety and stuff is just his body doing what it's supposed to do to fight off the infection. Infection. And the next morning, Kyle wakes up early and he seems to have improved. And the doctors do mention that he could be possibly discharged that day. He's eating, he's alert, he's awake, he's talking to his parents. So his dad, Jeremy, decides to go to the store and get, you know, the things you would need to bring your son home to help him recover. So I'm assuming, you know, liquids, some medicine, uh, things to help him be comfortable at home while he fights off this supposed meningitis infection. But when he is out, he receives a frantic call from his wife, Julie, and I'm going to share the transcript or, you know, the quote of the phone call. So Kyle's dad, Jeremy, says, This is the first time that there's really true concern for Kyle in Julie's voice. She was crying. In the background, I could hear Kyle. There was a moaning or a screaming behind Julie's voice. At this point, I'm out the door and headed for the hospital. As I get up to the floor, the doors open and I round the corner. I hear Kyle from the background, still screaming, and it's a, a horrifying scream that you would hear in a movie. I run down the hall and he's going into one of these seizures and he would scream and he would just lock up. Julie's crying. She doesn't know what to do. And then it stops and it's quiet and Kyle looks up and he goes did you guys hear that what was that noise isn't that crazy that's so scary I can't imagine my kid just like looking at me and being like what what was that so the rapid change in Kyle's mental status causes his doctor to kind of reevaluate his case and he's looking for a brain bleed or a possible tumor or anything that could be affecting Kyle's brain and changing his mental state like this and when he re-examines Kyle's brain he finds severe swelling uh, so they put Kyle in a medically induced coma to protect his breathing in case of another seizure and uh, after this the doctors re-examine his spinal fluid and that's when the doctor finds that Kyle has PAM or again Again, primary amoebic meningioencephalitis, which was caused by an Agleria phalari infection. Just a bit about how they would determine that. In the case of a, of a PAM infection, the cerebral spinal fluid would show a high eosinophils, um, which are a rare type of white blood cell and are usually present in parasitic infections and lead to diagnosing the specific type of meningitis, which is PAM. So the specific way that Nigleria phalari kills is by entering through the brain. They enter the body through the nose and pass the blood-brain barrier into the brain and attack the brain cells, puncturing them and feeding on the leaked fluid which causes an immune response and inflammation of the brain and the surrounding tissues, leading to PAM. Swelling causes the brain to push on the skull, which causes pressure, headaches, seizures, and eventually death. This is why the fact that it enters through the nose is important. Because the brain is surrounded by a blood-brain barrier, this barrier protects the brain but also keeps immune defenses out. So if this was an infection that 
occurred somewhere else in your body, it may be easier for your body to mount a defense because your white blood cells and your immune response doesn't have to get through this blood-brain barrier first. That's why it's important that the attack is directly to the brain because then it's hard for the body to mount response. Once they get into the brain, it's really rare for your immune system to be able to fight back and the amoebas can sort of just free feed and eventually this will cause death due to the uh, rapid death of your brain cells. Doctors in Kyle's case administer a powerful IV antibiotic to reduce the brain swelling, but sadly Kyle does not recover. He is declared brain dead and the decision is made to take him off of life support. And his parents say that they believe and it's quite likely that he got this infection from the family weekend vacation at the lake house where he was, you know, playing in the water, diving, that sort of thing. Kyle's family now raises awareness about Nigleria phalari and how simple it is to prevent an infection. And you can check out their website, kylecares.com, where they talk about prevention. And they also hold annual events in Kyle's memory and just share their story, which I think is really important, especially if it'll help other families that live in the southern states. It is, however, rare but possible to survive uh, infection with Nigleria phalari. This is directly from the CDC. Uh, although most cases of primary amoebic meningioencephalitis, or PAM, in the United States are fatal, so 141 out of 145, there have been five well-documented survivors in North America. So one in the US in 1978, one in Mexico in 2003, two additional survivors from the US in 2013, and one from the US in 2016. Now, this hasn't been updated clearly because I know of at least one more survivor since then. It has been suggested that the original US survivor, so the one from 1978, had a strain of Nigleria phalari that was less virulent, um, which means like less progressive, I think, anyways and that contributed to the patient's recovery. In laboratory experiments, the original strain from 1978 didn't cause as much damage to cells as rapidly as other strains. Recently, um, they've been doing sort of like a drug trial, an investigational breast cancer and anti-leishmania, which is another type of parasite drug called milt miltificine. We're gonna go with miltificine. It has shown some amoeba killing activity against free living amoeba, uh, including Nigleria phalari in the laboratory. And it's also been used to successfully treat patients infected with Balamuthia, which is another type of infection and acanthamoeba, which is another type of parasitic infection. After 35 years without an Igleria survivor in the United States, so from 78 to 2013, two children with an Igleria phalari infection survived that one summer of 2013. The first was a 12-year-old girl, and you can actually read quite a bit about her case online. They've been really good with following it. She was diagnosed with PAM 30 hours after becoming ill and was started on the recommended treatment within 36 hours. So she was diagnosed quite rapidly, which is um, key in Nigleria phalari infection, not a guarantee of recovery, but obviously the earlier you know that you have this infection, the earlier the doctors can treat it. She also received the investigational drug, miltificine, or however we decided to say it, and her brain swelling was aggressively managed with treatments that included cooling the body below normal body temperature, or therapeutic hypothermia. She made a full neurological recovery and even returned to school, and her recovery has been attributed to early diagnosis and treatment and novel therapeutics, including uh, miltificine and the hypothermia. The second child was an eight-year-old boy. He's also considered a PAM survivor, although he has suffered what is likely to be permanent brain damage. He was also treated with miltificine, but was diagnosed and treated several days after his symptoms began. Cooling of his body below the normal body temperature was not used. And then, in the summer of 2016, a 16-year-old boy was reported as the fourth U.S. PAM survivor. This patient was diagnosed within hours of presentation to the hospital and was treated with the same protocol used for the 12-year-old girl in 2013. 
this patient also made a full neurological recovery and returned to school. So as I said, early treatment is key, but not a guarantee. For example, a man died just this summer. I shared the article on uh, the Facebook page. He went on a family fishing trip and contracted pleurophalari, which led to a PAM infection, and he sadly passed away. The amoeba is rare. Survival is even rarer. Be aware and always assume infection in warm, fresh water. Nose plugs. Nose plugs are the key here. You can get nose plugs for like a dollar, and obviously it's not a concern for uh, people who may live, you know, local to where I am or even in Canada in general, but it has moved to some northern states and, you know, with global warming and everything going on with the environment, it is possible that it could be a concern in freshwater around, around the east coast or in Canada in general some days. So, also a lot of us go on southern vacations and it's just something to be aware of and also something that I thought was really crazy to learn about because I find that it's really rare nowadays to have a disease that is like almost always fatal and it's also interesting to see the survivors tend to be younger, diagnosed early, so the key there I would say is if you live in an area where you have the possibility of an aglirophalar infection and you start to feel these symptoms or your child or your friend or your spouse or whatever, that it would be, you know, important to mention these to your medical team, which I watched a video uh, that I'll link on the Facebook page because I want to list all my sources and everything. So on the Facebook page, I'll list this video and it's another survivor of an Igleria Falari infection. Her name is withheld because of patient confidentiality, obviously, but she's like interviewed for the video and that was part of the reasons she survived is early diagnosis. Her team didn't really know what was going on, her medical team. They just knew she had this meningitis and these symptoms and it kind of clicked like she had been at a water park just the day before these symptoms started and in that area they had had a death from Nigleria falari and it kind of just all came together and they realized that she very likely had a PAM infection and they started to treat her for that and as we know rapid treatment and early treatment is key to even a small possibility of survival and the treatment for this reminds me a lot of the treatment for rabies so i'm not going to go off on a whole other episode about rabies i i could i love to talk about illnesses but rabies is almost always fatal but they have developed this sort of pseudo treatment it's not a guarantee but they can induce you into a coma so your brain has time to heal and mount a defense against the rabies virus and it has been successful in a few cases so where the fatality rate um, if you weren't vaccinated for rabies used to always be 100% it's now I believe 98 or 97 or, or something similar to Nigleria falari because if it's caught early and rapidly there is this possibility although again not a guarantee that you can survive an infection so that was episode three um i hope that learning about uh, the brain eating amoeba was just as exciting as learning about crimes sorry for the delay in between episodes and i look forward to being back soon with episode four where we are finally going to cover what was supposed to be my original or first episode uh, the case of the spaceman or Granger Taylor. So thank you for listening and I'll see you next time, friends.